Colossians chapter 3, beginning in verse 1, let's talk about assimilating to the promised land. Colossians 3, verse 1. Paul writes, Since then you have been raised with Christ, set your hearts on things above, where Christ is seated at the right hand of God. Set your minds on things above, not on earthly things. For you died, and your life is now hidden with Christ in God. When Christ, who is your life, appears, then you will also appear with him in glory. Put to death, therefore, whatever belongs to your earthly nature, sexual immorality, impurity, lust, evil desires, and greed, which is idolatry. Because of these things, the wrath of God is coming. You used to walk in these ways in the life you once lived, but now you must rid yourselves of all such things as these, anger, rage, malice, slander, filthy language from your lips, and do not lie to each other, since you've taken off your old self with its practices and have put on the new self, which is being renewed in knowledge in the image of its creator. Here there is no Gentile or Jew, circumcised or uncircumcised, barbarian, Scythian, slave or free, but Christ is all and in all. Therefore, as God's chosen people, holy and dearly loved, clothe yourselves with compassion, kindness, humility, gentleness, and patience. Bear with each other and forgive one another if any of you has a grievance against someone. Forgive as the Lord forgave you. And over all these virtues, put on love, which binds them all together in perfect unity. Let's pray and invite the Holy Spirit to minister to us. Amen. A good hand clap for the word of God. That's good. Let's give thanks. Father, thank you that you loved us so much, that you sent your son for us. Father, thank you for your presence with us today. Father, I, I pray that as we receive your word, we would encounter your presence and your love. If your heart agrees with that, would you say amen, amen and amen. At the turn of the 20th century, Denise's great-grandparents emigrated from western Ukraine to Alberta, Canada. The Canadian government offered 120 acres of free land to anyone who could get to Edmonton. Within 10 years, the takers of the free land had to dig a well, they had to build a dwelling, they had to erect a fence around all 120 acres. Denise's forebears sold everything they had. They scraped together their money. They bought train tickets and ship passage. They packed their trunks with wheat seed and with farming tools, and they made the long journey just for a chance at a better life. But once they arrived in Western Canada, they had to totally adjust to life in a new land of opportunity. They had to adjust to new geography and a new climate. They had to assimilate to a new culture and a new political system. They had to learn a new language. Denise's great-grandmother, Baba Kirklevich, was a small but a mighty woman. Baba Kerglevich was only four foot eleven, but she was full of fire. She's the one that I mentioned before. She was illiterate. She never learned to read or write. She had to sign her name with an X on legal documents. It had to be witnessed by someone. But after she became a believer in Jesus, she prayed. She was so hungry for God's word, she begged the Lord. She said, Lord, it is too much for me to wait from Sunday to Sunday to hear your word. Please give me the ability to read the Bible. And God answered her prayer. She could read every word in her Bible and she could read nothing else. That's a true story. One day, Baba Kirklevich needed a new strainer to boil her pierogies, so she went down to the general store. 
When she didn't see what she was looking for, she decided to ask the clerk, only she didn't know the English word for a strainer or a colander. So with broken English, she said to the clerk, water go, macaroni stop. <laughs> Miraculously, the clerk understood what she was looking for and fetched a new strainer. To this day, in our house, when we reach for the strainer or for the colander, we say to each other, water go, macaroni stop. It takes time and patience and practice to assimilate to life in a new country. And maybe that helps us think about what Paul is trying to say in Colossians 3. This summer, we're reading together Paul's letter to the young Christians in the Turkish city of Colossae. And this morning, I want to share one big thought with you that perhaps you can think about this week. And this is the thought. What if we started thinking about our Christian life as a life of new possibilities in a new country? rather than thinking of it as a list of rules to keep. I'm so thankful for the upbringing I had in church. From the earliest time I can remember, I loved church. For me, church was a happy place to be. People were kind in church. People were good in church. But I have to say that Christianity was introduced to me as a set of rules to follow. Anybody else know what I'm talking about? We used to sing little Sunday school ditties. Oh, be careful little hands what you do. Be careful little hands what you do. For the Father up above is looking down in love. So be careful little hands what you do. And then the song went on. Be careful little eyes what you see. Be careful little feet. You, you see, the, the message was God is watching, so you better keep the rules. But the Bible urges us to think about the Christian life in much more exciting terms than that. The Bible urges us to think about the Christian life as a whole exciting new set of possibilities that were not available to us before. We can now do all kinds of wonderful things that we couldn't do before because we have relocated to a new country, as it were, to a land of promise. A few Sundays ago, we shared with you what Christ has done for us from Colossians 1. Christ has redeemed us. Christ has paid the ransom price for our freedom on the cross. We were once over our heads in spiritual debt, but Jesus paid the note in full and he canceled the enemy's claim on us. On the cross, he shouted, Tetelestai. It, in your Bible, it says it is finished, but the meaning is paid in full. Christ has removed our sticky sins from us. You ever got mixed up in crazy glue? Our sins are like that. They stick to us. But the blood of Jesus has removed our sins. He has rescued us from the rule of darkness. And he has relocated us into the realm of light. Just like the miraculous uh, evacuation at Dunkirk in World War II. We were about to perish at the hands of the enemy. But God picked us up. And he carried us over to England. He carried us over to a place of safety and security under his dominion. God has brought us into a whole new land of opportunities. But we have to assimilate to life into this new world. We have to learn a new culture. We have to learn a new language. We have to adopt new daily habits. We have to forget about life in the old country and we have to embrace the opportunities in this new country that there's an old saying when in rome do as the romans well what paul is telling us in colossians 3 is when in christ's kingdom do as christ looking at colossians 3 i see a few keys to assimilating 
to life in the promised land, I want to share them with you quickly. A few keys, assimilating to the promised land, a few keys from Colossians 3. The first key is this. In the promised land, adopt higher aspirations. You might have received an outline on your way in at the door. You can use that to follow along. You can fill in the blanks if you like and just help you to follow us. We're still waiting for our screens. They are. Jesus is coming and so are our screens. Hopefully our screens will get here before Jesus. Well, no, I don't mean that. Hopefully Jesus will come first. Forget the screens. <laughs> You won't have to listen to sermons in heaven. You'll know it all. Won't that be beautiful? Oh, thank you. <laughs> in the promised land, adopt higher aspirations. If you don't want to write the word aspirations, write goals. Adopt higher aspirations or goals. You see, in the old country, our aspirations were low. I didn't really realize the significance of the move Denise's family made until I visited Ukraine with my father-in-law. After 80-something years under communism, life in the Ukrainian village is, is still a lot like it was 100 years ago. Beloved, you want to talk about the most crushing, oppressive system that sucks the life out of everybody and everything. Go with me to the former Soviet Union. Go with me to Russia or Poland or travel with me to the villages of Ukraine and see what did not happen under communism. Most of the village homes have electricity now, but many still don't have indoor plumbing. Many are still heated by wood-burning stoves. Farming is still done by hand. We saw lots of horse-drawn carts and lots of people plowing with horses. My father-in-law pointed out to me that in the village in Ukraine, most of the homes only have one very small window or perhaps two very small windows at the most. And he explained to me why. For centuries, Ukraine was rolled over by the Germans and the Poles on one side and the Russians on the other. And when Ukraine was under the rule of the Russian czars, they had to pay very heavy taxes. The sky was considered to belong to the czar, so houses were taxed based on the number and the size of your windows. You had to pay taxes to the czar for the privilege of looking at his sky through your windows. Imagine the taxes on this sanctuary. We owe the czar a lot. Aren't you so thankful that we have a father who lets us look at his sky for free? Ukrainian villagers, by the way, I was thinking about that. If you think it's strange that, you know, they had to pay taxes based on the number of their windows, we pay taxes based on the number of our toilets, all right? So it's, it's not that different. But, but they had little hope. They had little hope to own their own farms. They, they were like serfs to the czar. Most of what they produced was taken away from them, and, and it got intensely worse under Lenin and Stalin. You see, under that kind of crushing oppression, expectations are very low. There's little hope for a better life. And that's just like us when we were under the dominion of darkness. Paul says that our minds were set on earthly things. Now, earthly things can include sinful excesses, but, but really what it, it means is just simply that we're very focused on the cares of this life. We're very focused on the business of this life as if there's nothing beyond. To have our minds set on earthly things means that we live as if this is all there is. Paul wrote about that to the Corinthians. He said, if only we have hope in this life, then Christianity is a complete waste of our time. If this, if this life is all there is, we might as well eat, drink, and be merry. If this life is all there is, we should wring all the pleasure we can out of it. We, we should fully indulge ourselves. We should fully express ourselves. We should fully avenge ourselves. 
You see, that was the mindset in the old country. The mindset in the old country was, this is all there is. But in the promised land, our aspirations are high. When Denise's family moved, they had to get rid of that old servile mindset and they had to adopt new aspirations. In Canada, the possibilities were endless. In Canada, there was the promise of property ownership and of prosperity. There was the promise of education and advancement. There was the promise of freedom and security. In Canada, they gained access to electricity and indoor plumbing and central heat. They bought automobiles, tractors for their farming. In Canada, they had access to medical care. They enjoyed better health. They lived longer lives. Their children graduated from high school and then from university. They started businesses and flourished and not a few of them became millionaires. And that's precisely what Paul is saying to us in these opening verses of Colossians 3. Since you have been raised with Christ, set your heart on things above where Christ is seated at the right hand of God. Set your mind on things above, not on earthly things. Since God has relocated us into a new realm in Christ, let's forget about life in the old country and let's aspire to higher things. In the promised land, we aspire to overcome. Paul says, I want you to think about this for a minute. Think about the fact that Jesus is seated at the right hand of God. You know, the seat at the right hand of the king was reserved for the conquering general. It was reserved for the one who had defeated the king's enemies. The seat at the right hand of the king is the seat of power. Authority is delegated to the person who sits in that seat to govern and to make decisions and to grant favors in the king's name. The seat at the right hand of the king is the seat of the heir apparent, the one who is going in to inherit everything the king has. Paul says, I want you to think about this for a minute. Jesus is settled in that seat. The one that you have become united with by faith, the one with whom you have been co-crucified and co-resurrected, the one in whom your life has become hidden, the one who is dwelling inside of you. He is sitting in the seat of the ultimate conqueror. He is sitting in the seat of all authority. He is sitting in the seat of the heir of all things. That means that you and I can expect to overcome in this life. Beloved, listen, we are not at the mercy of the elements. We are not at the mercy of the fates. We are not at the mercy of the powers that be, whether they be spiritual powers or whether they be earthly powers. We are one with the one who is sitting in the seat of all power and all authority and all provision. We are one with the one who commands the angelic armies of heaven. We are one with the one who has disarmed the demonic powers and has made a public spectacle of them, triumphing over them by his cross. The writer of Hebrews cried out, God has said, I will never leave you. I will never forsake you. So we say with confidence, the Lord is my helper. I am not going to live in fear in this world. What can anyone do to me? In the promised land, we aspire to ultimate victory. Paul says, think about this. Think about it. You live as if this life is all there is. But think about it. Your life is hidden with Christ. And when he comes, you will share in his glory. That means that the investment of living this Christian life is not for nothing. We will be richly rewarded. In the old country, Denise's family could keep precious little of what they worked for. But in Canada, they kept most of it. 
and they prospered wildly. In the same way, if we live for this life alone, we will have absolutely nothing to show for it at the end. But if we live for those things which are above, in the end, every effort we've made and every sacrifice we've made will bring a rich reward. Paul says that Christ will share a portion of his own glory with us. That means that some of his own awesomeness is going to rub off on us. Get rid of the mindset from the old country that, that what you see here on earth is all there is. Set your hearts and minds on things above. Aspire for something higher. Aspire for success in Christ. Aspire for ultimate victory in Christ. Assimilating to the promised land. Four keys from Colossians 3. First of all, adopt higher aspirations. Secondly, in the promised land, embrace purer morals. In the promised land, embrace purer morals. Paul says here in the old country, our morals were poor. In verse 5 of Colossians 3, Paul describes an escalating ladder of sexual immorality. At its core, Paul says, it begins with greed. It begins with the attitude that everything exists for my pleasure, for my enjoyment, for my satisfaction. Paul says greed is idolatry because it puts our desires ahead of God. Greed puts our satisfaction ahead of honoring and obeying our maker. Greed spawns lust and evil desires. In our hearts and in our minds, we begin to objectify others for our gratification. We begin to fantasize. Jesus said it's possible to commit adultery without ever having physical contact with another person. It's possible to commit adultery in our minds. Lust gives birth to illicit sexual relations. That's sex outside of the beautiful covenant of marriage. Fornication is sex between unmarried people. Adultery is breaking a marriage covenant and having sex outside of that marriage. Illicit sex opens the door to perverted sex. This is what Paul calls impurity in verse 5, abuse during sex or objectifying your partner during sex. Paul says that all those poor morals belong to the old country but in the promised land our morals are pure in the promised land we operate out of a paradigm of gratitude rather than greed rather than living as entitled people we are thankful people we don't consider ourselves as deserving of more than what God has allotted to us which is to enjoy sex within the covenant of marriage in the promised land we operate out of a paradigm of selfless love. Lust and fantasizing and illicit sex and perverted sex all exploit others for our pleasure. That's why Paul says it's rooted in greed because greed runs over every, anyone it must in order to get what it wants. That's precisely the opposite of agape love, which is self-sacrificing love. You know, it's no surprise that when Paul is describing our new Christian life that he tackles sexuality first. Paul discusses sexuality in every one of his letters. So apparently this is an area where it's very hard to make a break with the old country. God created us as sexual beings. He created us male and female. Sex was his idea. It's his gift. When we use it properly, sex is uplifting. It, it brings joy. It's productive. It's good for our soul. It's good for our health. Someone described it this way. Sex is like fire. In the fireplace, fire is productive. It provides warmth, heat, light. It allows us to cook. Fire is necessary for life. But out of the fireplace... Fire is an uncontrollable disaster. It damages, it, 
it destroys, it even causes death, and that's just like sex. Within the safety of the covenant of marriage, it's a blessing. It's necessary for life. Marriage is the fireplace where sex is safe. But if you take it out of the marriage, it damages and it destroys. Paul says it brings the wrath of God. Now that doesn't mean that God starts chucking lightning bolts down from heaven. What it means is that God allows people to reap the unwanted consequences of their sin. Illicit sex brings depression. It brings disease. It brings dysfunction. It, it creates children who are being raised without the love of both father and mother. It, it, or yet, worse yet, it, it brings the destruction of unwanted children. In verse 7, Paul says, You used to live like this in the old country, but no more assimilate to the new. Assimilating to the promised land, four keys from Colossians 3. Adopt higher aspirations, embrace higher morals. Third, in the promised land, wear a better attitude. Wear a better attitude. In the old country, we used to wear dirty rags. The Bible often uses the metaphor of changing our clothing as a description of changing our lifestyle. Paul uses that same metaphor here in Colossians 3 when he says, take this off and put that on. Have you ever been so filthy that you literally have a hard time peeling your clothes off? When we were kids, we used to play in the summer rain. We used to love making mud pies, squishing the mud between our toes. The Neshaminy Creek backed up to our neighborhood. We loved playing in the creek. We would play for hours, and we would come home covered in mud. My mother would stop us at the front door, and she would say, strip now. And we literally had a hard time sometimes peeling those muddy clothes off of us. At the front door of the Christian life, Paul is saying to us, stop and strip right now. Just as with sexuality, Paul describes a ladder of escalating anger. It begins with simmering anger inside of us that we haven't dealt with. In Ephesians 4, Paul quotes the Old Testament. He says, be angry and do not sin. Do not let the sun go down on your wrath. Beloved, can I tell you that often it's not a sin to get angry, but we will sin if we don't deal with our anger. We need to take our anger to God. We need to confess it. We need to begin the process of forgiving whomever or whatever has made us angry. If we let our anger simmer, Paul says in these verses, it will turn to malice. We start imagining what we'd like to do to the person who hurt us, how we'd like to pay him back or her back. We start wishing bad things would happen to that person and we want to celebrate when they do. In verse 11, Paul says that part of that simmering anger and malice includes prejudice based on someone's ethnicity or religion or culture or social class. Simmering anger and malice explodes into episodes of rage. Our anger boils over and from our mouths come curses and abusive speech and threats. We slander the character of those that we're angry with, even make up false stories. I want to pause here and I want to think about something together. Chapter 3 of Colossians almost seems to contradict what Paul has told us in chapter 2. In chapter 2, Paul told us legalism doesn't work. Rule keeping doesn't work. Rules don't do anything to curb our sin nature inside of us. Now in in chapter 3, it almost sounds as if Paul is giving us rules. Put to death immorality. Take off anger and all that comes with it. But beloved, the reason that Paul tells us to stop in chapter 3 
is because now we can. You see, before we were in Christ, we didn't want to stop and we couldn't have stopped even if we wanted to. But now in Christ, we can stop. This is not a reintroduction of legalism. Paul is encouraging us to apply the new power that we have in Christ. I'm the youngest of three in my family. When I was still very small, before I even started school, my, my older sister Lisa had a bicycle with training wheels on it. We lived on a big hill, and I used to get on my sister's bike with the training wheels, and I would coast down the big heel, hill. I didn't know how to ride a bike. Uh, the bike was too big for me to handle, but the training wheels kept me upright, and the hill gave me momentum. The only problem is at the bottom of the hill, I didn't know how to stop the bike. And so the only way I had to stop was to crash into something. Poor Mrs. Moffat, she lived at the end of our street. I ruined her hedges. I crashed into them again and again. I saw Mrs. Moffat at a funeral a while back ago. I should have said, I'm sorry, Mrs. Moffat. When all the kids were playing, I would sneak away and I'd get on my sister's bike and I'd start coasting and then they'd see me and they all chase after me, stop, stop, stop. And then I'd have an epic crash at the bottom of the hill. The bike was too big for me to even push back up the hill so I'd just leave it laying there in a heap. Finally, when I was big enough, my parents got me my own bike and they shared with me a valuable piece of secret information. They said, in order to stop, just pedal backwards and there's a break. Now you tell me. You could have spared me multiple crashes. But you know, this knowledge wouldn't have helped me earlier. I, I, I was too small. I, I didn't have enough strength to stop the bike. Beloved, before we knew Christ, we were all toddlers on a bike, unable to stop ourselves from sexual immorality or from runaway anger. We were destined to crash every time. But now Paul tells us to stop because we can stop. We now have the strength to stop. Not our own strength, but Christ's strength inside of us. We now have the means to stop. We have a break. It's the grace of God and the power of the Holy Spirit. We have the knowledge to stop. We don't have to end in a crash. We have self-control in Jesus. Paul says that runaway anger is how we used to dress in the old country. But now in the new promised land, we are beautifully dressed. When Denise's family moved to Canada, they soon learned that their traditional Ukrainian, Ukrainian clothing was no match for Alberta winters. They had to learn how to dress like the Canadians. They had to learn how to dress in layers. In the same way, Paul tells us that in the promised land, we have to learn how to dress in some new layers as well. He says the base layer is compassion. The ability to sympathize. The ability to empathize with others. Jonathan, I, I have to say that my father-in-law is genuinely the epitome of compassion. He has the capacity more than any other man that I've ever known to put himself in the shoes of the other person, to consider how they feel, to consider the perspective that they're looking from. He, he is full of the fruit of the Spirit that is compassion. Paul said on top of compassion, put on kindness goodness being nice on top of kindness layer humility valuing others on top of humility layer gentleness it's a word that Jesus used of himself it means strength under control over that Paul said put on a layer of patience the word is long suffering that means putting up with someone when they are irritating the life out of you over that is forbearance. Forbearance is not only putting up with someone who's irritating you, it's actually offering him a helping hand and bearing him up, lifting him up. Over that is forgiveness. The willingness to forgive someone 
who's wronged us. And then Paul said, over all of those layers, put on like a great big overcoat, God's selfless love. Agape is love that puts the needs of others first. It's sacrificial love. All of these layers, they're very similar to the fruit of the Holy Spirit in the book of Galatians. And all of these layers, they insulate us in the world from getting injured by others. They insulate us from the angry barbs that people throw at us. When I was in college, we were playing hide and seek one night. It was kind of a chilly night, so I had on a thermal undershirt. On top of my thermal undershirt, I had on an Oxford. Over that, I had on a sweatshirt. And over that, I had a, a down jacket. A few of us were hiding by some bushes, and the guy who was it flushed us out. I took off running as fast as I could. What I didn't know is that there was a barbed wire fence ahead in front of me. My friends started yelling, stop, stop. It was like a flashback to being on the hill on Irma Road on the bike. Stop, stop. But it was too late. I ran full speed into that barbed wire fence. I must have looked like something out of a Roadrunner cartoon because I hit that fence and then wah, wah, and I bounced back like 15 feet and landed on my back. My friends were concerned. They were trying to get to me, but they were laughing so hard they couldn't run. Thankfully, I wasn't hurt, but there was one barb, one barb right here on my chest. It pierced my jacket. It pierced my sweatshirt. It pierced my Oxford. It pierced my thermal undershirt. That stupid barb ruined a lot of good clothing. But the good news is, is it didn't pierce my heart. It just left a little tiny scratch on me. And that's precisely what happens when we are dressed up in the beautiful layers of the promised land. Now and then an angry barb that someone throws might penetrate some of the layers, but it won't pierce our heart. It'll just leave a little scratch on us because we're layered with compassion and kindness and humility and gentleness and patience and forgiveness all under the overcoat of his love. Assimilating to the promised land, four keys from Colossians 3. Adopt higher aspirations. Embrace higher morals. Wear a better attitude. And finally this, worship team, you can come help me finish if you would, please. In the promised land, develop a new daily routine. In the promised land, develop a new daily routine. I want to finish with this final simple thought. Someone observed, rightly, that getting dressed is something that we do every day. Every morning we get up and we have a routine and each of us have our own unique and special way that we go about our morning routine, but, but we, we get dressed in a certain order and in a certain way. And that's just like assimilating to, to life in, in a new country. When Denise's family moved to Alberta, they had to develop a new daily routine. Day by day by day, over a period of years, they became Canadians. And it's no difference for us. Paul says in Colossians 3 verse 11, we have put on the new self, which is continuously being renewed in the image of our creator. In other words, Paul says this business of assimilating to a new culture, that this business of learning a new language, uh, of learning a new way to dress, it is a process that happens day by day by day by day. What if there was a way that we could practice daily taking off the old country? and daily putting on what belongs to the new? What if there was a way that, that we could daily put on higher aspirations and purer morals and a better attitude? Can I tell you there is a way? And the way is simply by making a daily confession. I'm going to challenge you to an experiment. Research says that it takes 
about 60 days to break an old habit and to form a new one. I want to challenge you for the next two months to make a daily confession based on the truths that we've learned in the book of Colossians. I've written something for you. It's printed on that handout that you received this morning at the door on the way in. You can use that as your own confession. You can use it as it is, or you can even use it as a starting place, and you can add some things of your own. But would you try assimilating to a new country, to a new culture, to a new language, a new identity, by confessing who you are in Christ day by day? I want to invite you to stand with me this morning, and I want us to finish to make this confession together. It, it's on the back of the handout that you received at the door. If you didn't get one, you can just scooch over next to someone who's holding one. And to finish our service this morning, I simply want to read this confession, and I want to encourage you, day by day by day, take off the old and put on the new. Let's read this. I'm not, I'm, we're going to read it together in unison. My daily confession. Are you ready? Let's read. Father God, today I confess that Jesus Christ has redeemed me, having paid my ransom with his own blood on the cross. Today I confess that Jesus has removed my sticky sins from me. Today I confess that Jesus has rescued me from the rule of darkness and has relocated me into the realm of light. Today I confess that I am under the peace and security of his dominion. Father God, today I renounce my way of life in the old country. I renounce low aspirations. I renounce my former mindset and behavior as if this life is all there is. I renounce greed, lust, evil desires, illicit sex, and perverted sex. I renounce simmering anger, malice, prejudice, rage, abusive speech, threats, and gossip. Today, I put a stop to these things because I can through Christ's strength. Father God, Today, I put on higher aspirations. Today, I aspire for success through Christ, who is settled in the seat of power and authority and provision. Today, I aspire for ultimate victory through Christ, who is my rewarder and my great reward. Today, I put on in the place of greed, gratitude, and selfless love for others. Today I put on layers of compassion and kindness and humility and gentleness and patience and forbearance and forgiveness. Over all these things, I put on the overcoat of your love. Father God, today I forsake the old country and I assimilate to the promised land. Today, renew me into your image as I know Jesus better. In Jesus' name, amen. Would you put down those papers and give Jesus a good praise in this place today? Come on, let's give him a good praise.